Some of you know that in addition to interning here at Christ Church this summer, I'm also studying uh, languages in preparation for further studies. So since my Latin course began uh, a week and a half ago, I've had to learn how to decline various nouns, conjugate different verb tenses, and figure out bits of uh, syntax. And for those of you who have studied another language, you know that it's not always um, easy to pick up the patterns and the idioms of thought of a different language that can be quite different from your own native tongue. And I think this is true for those of you who have uh, learned some other kind of language, whether it be that of music, of business, the natural sciences, or some other technical idiom. There are um, patterns and, and modes of the language that you have to learn, uh, become proficient in, in a community of competent speakers of the language to be able to use the language well. And people learn languages for some end, for some purpose. So you might learn a language to uh, converse with your grandparents, to communicate with global business partners, uh, or perhaps even to read medieval theological texts, although that's probably few of us, I suspect. The point is, those who learn languages do so with great difficulty in a community of competent speakers for some goal, some purpose. And I want to suggest that this metaphor of learning a language is a helpful way to think about what's going on at the end of Paul's letter to the first uh, to the Thessalonians, his first letter to them, which you can find in your bulletins on page nine. In chapter five, verses 12 and following, we find a list of instructions that, as one commentator puts it, seems at first glance to possess all the coherence and logic of a grocery list. We can think of these instructions, though, as, as a part of a, a Christian grammar. Um, and like any new language, this grammar might seem odd and confusing at first, but it begins to make sense as you spend more time with it, as you acquire in a community of competent speakers uh, the beliefs, dispositions, and practices needed to speak the language well. And remember, you learn a language for some purpose, for some goal. And I think Paul commends uh, this grammar, if you will, the grammar of the Christian faith to the Thessalonians for uh, this purpose. Uh, it seems to be, and this seems to be the purpose for us as well, that as daytime people, as people of the light, as he said uh, in chapter four and again in five, as daytime people, we need to learn the grammar of the Christian faith, or better, of the new creation that God has launched in and through Christ in order to live rightly as God's people in God's world. And I'll say that once more and then try to explain what I mean. As daytime people, we need to learn the grammar of the Christian faith, or better, the new creation that God has launched in and through Christ in order to live rightly as God's people in God's world. And it's my thinking that the instructions he gives in Thessalonians, uh, to the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians 5, as well as the virtues he commends, love, patience, and I think humility, can only be rightly understood within a larger story, which is the story of God, uh, which begins at the beginning of the Bible in the book of Genesis, stretches through the Old Testament's uh, stories of the patriarchs, the judges, the kings, the prophets, reaches its climax in the story of Christ with his life, death, and resurrection, and continues on into the stories of the New Testament churches, including the one at Thessalonica and to the churches of today, including Christ Church. And it's my thinking that we must have some sense of this big story, this story of God, and our place in it if we are to make sense of the beliefs, dispositions, and practices of Christian community. Uh, otherwise, they might appear as a set of arbitrary rules that we're supposed to do now, but eventually when Christ returns, perhaps uh, we give them up. But that doesn't seem to be the case. We seem to be learning this language for a purpose, and it's uh, the purpose of new creation. 
So what I want to try and do is sketch uh, an overview of this big story of God and try and show how Paul's letter to the Thessalonians fits in this story and how these uh, beginning instructions, which we'll look at the bulk of next week, how they fit in this um, call to learn the grammar of the new creation, to live as one who has been transferred from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of light and to fulfill the vocation that God always intended for humans. So as many of you will know, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth and called everything good. And he creates humans and gives them a vocation, a task. Genesis 1, we see in verses 26 and 28, he says, God, let us make, make human in our image after our likeness and let human reign over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created human in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and reign over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So we see in this passage and in other places in Genesis and throughout Scripture that we were created to exercise God's rule and reign over creation. Creation was, as it were, designed as a project created to go somewhere. God creates humans, places them in the garden, and it says, extend this garden outwards, rule and subdue the earth, reign over it, uh, exercise my wise and loving rule on my behalf, over the creation. And as those made in his image, it was our royal as well as priestly vocation to carry out this project uh, to reflect God's glory, his wise reign and rule into the world, and in turn to sum up the praises of creation and reflect those back to God. Sadly, though, we read in Genesis 3 that we failed in this task by turning to idols dishonoring God and failing to give him thanks. God refused to abandon his creation, though, even though we failed to carry out the vocation he gave us to extend his reign over all the earth. On account of his gracious election, he called a man named Abram, whom we later uh, know as Abraham, out of Mesopotamia and promised to him that he would become a great community or nation or people that his name would be great, that he would be a blessing to others, and that through him all the peoples of the earth would be blessed. God binds himself to this elected man and the covenant community that descends from him. And because of this covenant, God comes to his people's aid some 400 years later when they are enslaved in Egypt. With an outstretched arm and mighty acts of judgment, he delivers his people, the Israelites, from the Egyptians gives them the Mosaic Law, which is itself a grammar of faith, and eventually brings them into a land flowing with milk and honey, the Promised Land. There they continue to commune with God in a dwelling place known as the Tabernacle. As a called out holy people, the Israelites bear witness to the reality that God has not given up on his creation, nor on his project to extend his reign and rule through humans, his image bears. As in the Garden of Genesis, so in the Tabernacle of Israel, his intention is to dwell with his people and giving, give them the privilege of serving as a royal priesthood over his creation. This story, this large story of God, continues in the life of King David with God promising to establish an eternal kingdom, thus creating hopes for a coming Messiah or deliverer. And it continues on into the prophets. It is in the prophets, speaking during the time of the Babylonian exile, the temporary rejection of Israel by God, that we learn that the great nation or community promised to Abraham would eventually extend to others. This was God's intention all along. Thus in Isaiah we read, for example, uh, that God intends to bless all the nations that they come to him. He will judge them and bring peace. He will wipe all tears and swallow up death. He will heal them by making all things new and importantly for our purposes, will create a new heaven and a new earth. This is new creation. The early Christians understood the story of Jesus and the story of the church 
to be the fulfillment of the story of Israel. Note, I didn't say replacement or supersession. They confessed that the original vision for creation and for humans within it had been recaptured and restored through Jesus' inauguration of God's kingdom, his sovereign rule. As one biblical scholar writes, what Jesus did and said was designed to give a decisive answer in deeds as well as words to the question, what would it look like if God were running things? And as in Genesis, part of the answer to that question was, it would look like obedient humans following the obedient human, Christ, acting as stewards over creation, bringing new creation to birth, and gathering up praises of that creation to present it to its maker. Much more could be said about this overarching story of God, but for our purposes, I simply wanted to draw your attention to the theme of new creation and our vocation in it to extend the wise, loving reign of God upon the earth. The biblical hope is not that when we die, hallelujah, by and by we'll fly away to some distant place called heaven. No, the biblical hope is that the Lord Christ will return to this world, unite heaven and earth together, and make his dwelling place with us. We will be his people, and God himself will be with us as our God. Then, by participating in the rule of Christ by the Holy Spirit, we will fully carry out the vocation God originally gave us in the garden. This is what Paul says in Romans and elsewhere, uh, and if you're attentive to it, you can find this royal language all throughout the New Testament. When, for example, he writes in Romans 5.17, For if because of one's man, one man's trespasses, Adam's, death reigned through the one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Or consider that great hymn in Revelation 5 that is sung to Jesus. Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God, from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and a priest, there's your royal and your priestly language, to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. The grammar of Christian faith, then, is not an arbitrary set of rules, but rather the language of the new creation, the language that we will speak when God brings to completion, to consummation, uh, his new creation, which he has already begun in Christ. And so the well-known fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control, isn't something we practice now, but won't when Christ returns. As those who have been transferred from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of light, by the life, death, and resurrection of Christ, we as the church are a new creation, the launching point of God's mission to the world. Eventually when the Lord returns, as the prophet Habakkuk says, the, Lord, the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God as the waters cover the sea and we will reign over the new creation with Christ. With that goal or end in view, we are to grow up into Christ himself who is our head, learning the grammar of the new creation by the power of the Holy Spirit, waiting for the day when Christ will return. As in all his epistles, Paul has this hope of new creation in mind when he writes to the Thessalonians. His injunctions aren't really intelligible apart from this larger story. We should briefly recall the circumstances of his writing to the Thessalonians. Paul, along with Silvanus and Timothy, founded the church in Thessalonica around 50 AD. After spending some number of months with the believers there, less than a year probably, the people had become very dear to Paul and company. They write in 1 Thessalonians 2.8, So being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you had become very dear to us. Suddenly, though, they found themselves in the midst of much conflict and were forced to flee under the cover of darkness one night, as we read in the book of Acts, chapter 17. From what was most likely Corinth, Paul fervently prayed for the new believers in Thessalonica and, like a loving parent, worried about how they were doing. He sent Timothy to them to see how they were doing, received a good report, and then sent this letter, 1 Thessalonians, to them. 
he spends most of the letter, three of five chapters, telling them how he's been praying for them, how he thanks God for them, and how he longs to see them. On the whole, this new church seems to be doing pretty well. He turns in the second part of the letter then, beginning in chapter 4, to remind them of some important matters, to encourage them and to exhort them in pressing on and following Christ. He writes in chapter 4, verse 1, Finally then, brothers and sisters, we ask and urge you in the Lord that as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God, just as you were doing, that you do so more and more. He exhorts them as those chosen by God, loved by God, and called out by God to keep following Jesus, to keep living in light of the reality that Jesus is King. That's what the bit in chapters 4 and 5 about the coming of the Lord and the day of the Lord is all about. Whether because of persecutions, perhaps the same conflict that forced Paul to flee, or because of some grief in the community over those who had recently died, Paul reminds them that they are not without hope. Christ will return, Paul says, with the cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. You are the children of light, he tells them, children of the day. The light of the world, Christ, has come into the world, inaugurating his kingdom and defeating sin, death, and all demonic powers and principalities by his death on a cross. He has reconciled us to God and by the power of his spirit, empowered us to participate in his reign and rule, the original human vocation described in Genesis. Secure in the gracious redemption accomplished by Christ, we the church, or Christ's body and thus the new humanity, are to live as the worshiping missional community on earth. 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 through 22, and we'll look at verses 12 through 15 this week, are some of the practices, some of the virtues of such a community. That is a community of forgiven, redeemed people who eagerly look forward to the return of the Lord and the consummation of his kingdom. The task of this community is to learn the grammar of the new creation and ultimately to live in anticipation of our role in it as the new humanity who will reign over the new creation with Christ our Lord. That's why these instructions in um, chapter 5, verses 12 through 22, follow immediately after Paul's words about the coming of the Lord and the day of judgment. That said, let's look at the first of his instructions, and we'll consider the bulk of them next week. You can find the passage again on page 9. He begins writing in verses 12 and 13, We ask you, brothers and sisters, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord, and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. We are, as it were, hearing one part of a conversation, which makes it a bit difficult to say much about the situation in Thessalonica. Throughout the letter, though, Paul has spoken very well of the Thessalonians, so it, it seems uh, improper to speculate about some conflict between leaders and other members. Perhaps the next sentence offers a clue. Be at peace among yourselves. Although things are going relatively well in the community at Thessalonica, Paul asked the believers to attend to certain matters because presumably he knows how easy it is for conflicts and divisions to arrive. He certainly had his fair share in uh, the church at Corinth, for example. Thus they may be sober, watchful, and alert, striving to walk in a manner that pleases the Lord, which again is what Paul exhorts the believers to do in 1 Thessalonians 4.1, takes effort. Yes, undoubtedly, we are saved by grace through faith in the Son of God, who loved us and gave himself up for us. As Paul and others repeatedly stress, though, it takes real spirit-empowered effort to put on the virtues of the new creation and to put off, or better put to death, the patterns of thought, speech, and behavior that belong to the old age, or eon, of sin and death. As he says in Galatians before listing the fruit of the Spirit, but I say walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. And a little later, if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. So yes, striving to live as a citizen of God's kingdom takes effort. The good news is that because of what Christ has done, 
we are no longer slaves to sin and such efforts are not in vain. One reason Paul might be drawing attention to how we should relate to our leaders is because he knows that the nature of their work is particularly good at provoking our old selves. Consider two of the things leaders do. Uh, they serve over us and they admonish others. And if they're serving faithfully in their roles, they're doing very hard work. The verb there, in labor among you, is the same one Paul uses earlier in the letter to describe his physical labor in Thessalonica as a tent maker. He labored day and night, as he says, that he might not be a burden to any of the Thessalonians. So who wants to be around someone who's strenuously striving to exercise authority over them, including at times to admonish them? It's likely to provoke our old selves, the uh, ways of the flesh, as it were. But the answer to this question, who wants to be around someone who's strenuously striving to exercise authority over them, including at times to admonish them, is people who know they are loved by the one who's over them and who trust God's good design for his church. The phrase over you in the Lord, while containing a sense of authority over, also means care for. Paul's a good example. He writes earlier in the letter of his time in Thessalonica saying, we could have made demands as apostles of Christ, but we were gentle among you, like a nursing mother taking care of her children. And later, for you know how, like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you, that's an interesting bit, each one of you, and encouraged you to walk in a manner worthy of God, who calls you into his own kingdom. So we might be wondering how did um, such authority over, care for, go? Well, remember the report that Timothy delivered to Paul. This is the reason uh, he's sending the letter, because Timothy has brought back a good report, and now he's writing to them. He mentions this report in chapter 3, writing that Timothy reported that you all always remember us kindly and long to see us as we long to see you. To be over others in the Lord is with wisdom, love, and yes, authority, to care for them, to desire that they grow up in the Lord and press on to greater and greater maturity. Such care will undoubtedly involve from time to time admonishments. To admonish is not simply to provide information. No, here as elsewhere in Paul's letter, it means to call out wrong behaviors. It's an attempt to correct an attitude of both mind and spirit. This means that one job of a leader in the church is to confront and correct. Anyone who's been confronted and corrected before knows that it isn't fun. Yet, if we're honest, and admonishing is simply a form of truth-telling, most of us know we need to be lovingly confronted and corrected from time to time. We need other people in our lives who will speak words of truth to us to see ourselves rightly. And some of our cherished relationships are probably those people who do speak such words to us. The writer of Hebrews says, but exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. There's this idea if people don't speak words of truth to us, we can't see ourselves rightly and we'll be hardened in our sin, in these um, old, sinful patterns of thought, speech, and behavior. And so when we fail to speak the truth to one another, which at times will surely include admonishing one another, we fail to love one another. What a tragedy it is when someone sees another walking in the wrong direction, a direction that won't lead to joy, peace, and life, but rather to despair, unrest, and ultimately death, and fails to say something. So thanks be to God for those who are over us in the Lord and will lovingly speak the truth to us, both in the pulpit and in person. When leaders in the church serve us in this way, they, to quote the first reading from 2 Samuel 23, dawn on us like the morning light, like the sun shining forth on a cloudless morning, like rain that makes grass to sprout from the earth. May we rightly respect them and esteem them very highly in love because of their work, eschewing both hostile resistance to their care and because it's on account of their work that we esteem them, uh, exaggerated affection or obsequiousness for them. They, like us, have a role to play in the body of Christ to help us learn the grammar of the new creation, and for that we should be grateful. Paul then turns to the wider body of believers in 
verses uh, 14 and 15, writing, And we ask you, brothers and sisters, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with all, see that no one repays anyone for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. Having described in part how we are relate to leaders in the church, he now goes on to describe how we are to relate to one another. Interestingly enough, we too are called to admonish one another at times. The task isn't just something that professionals do, that is the clergy. As I've already suggested, admonishing one another in love is simply a form of truth-telling. It's worth asking, what does it mean to tell the truth? The theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer asked this question once in a similarly titled essay. He begins by considering what a lie is, claiming that the standard account of a lie as a conscious discrepancy between what you think and what you say it isn't quite adequate. Ad adequate. It's not wrong, it's just inadequate. So he tries to consider the matter again, asking what is a lie from the perspective of Christ. And he takes 1 John 2, 22 as his subject matter, which reads, who is a liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ or the King? As Bonhoeffer says, we can deny this reality that Jesus is King by speech or, importantly, by silence. Failure to admonish one another in love when admonishment is needed is, in a sense, to lie. That is, to deny that Jesus is King and we are His body whose lives are inseparably intertwined with one another. So if someone needs to be admonished and we don't admonish them in love, we're denying that our lives are inseparably bound up with one another uh, because of Christ, who is our head. Um, and it's not, it's not just someone else's problem that has nothing to do with us, but it affects the whole body in a sense. And, and left unchecked, left ad, uh, unadmonished, we become hardened in our sin, and then deep divisions and conflict can pull the community apart. And all of this, failing to admonish one another in love as a failure to tell the truth, ultimately impedes the church's mission to act as ministers of reconciliation in a lost and dying world. This is why it's vital, and this is why Paul says to this church is doing fairly well, uh, is, is tell the truth to one another, admonish one another, uh, be a community marked by truth-telling. Don't settle for a veneer of niceness on Sunday, but live close enough to people that you can, in love, speak the truth to them, and they the truth to you. And at times, when it truly will be needed, you can admonish them, and they can correct their ways, amend their ways, begin to walk again um, as is fitting for those in the Lord, for those who belong to the new creation. It's worth noting that idol probably isn't the best translation here. It doesn't really capture the sense of what's going on. It's not wrong. It just doesn't capture everything. A better translation would be disorderly or unruly, which in the ESV you'll see in the footnotes uh, as an alternative translation. So these such people aren't just idle or lazy. They're disorderly, disruptive in the body of Christ. And so for the good of the body and for the good of such persons, they need to be admonished that they might amend their ways and walk in a manner that pleases the Lord. Paul moves on to instruct the Thessalonians to encourage the faint-hearted, uh, which literally means little-souled. Some Christians in Thessalonica might have been grieving over the recent deaths of other believers, been worried about social turmoil directed against them, the same turmoil that forced Paul to flee, or been upset about some other matter. Most of us can probably relate most of us have probably been, at one point or another, discouraged, depressed, down and out, or perhaps even near the point of despair. Again, care for such persons is not reserved to the pastorate, to the professionals. It's a task given to all of us. Encourage here means to console someone over something. It's the same word that's used in the Gospel of John when uh, uh, some try to comfort Martha and Mary over the death of their brother Lazarus. Speaking earlier in uh, the letter to the Thessalonians about those who have died in the Lord, Paul writes that he does not want the Thessalonians to grieve as others do who have no hope. 
Now, notice he doesn't say he doesn't want them to grieve. Grieving can be entirely appropriate. He says he doesn't want them to grieve as those who have no hope. And what is their hope? It's the same hope that Jesus speaks to the faint-hearted Martha in the Gospel of John. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. And for Paul, resurrection means bodily resurrection unto new creation. That is, new heaven and new earth. So the Christian hope, the hope that Paul is reminding the Thessalonians of, that he's uh, telling them to encourage one another in, to console one another with, is the hope that Christ will return and make heaven and earth new. It's not that, as it were, Christ will return and whisk us away before He blows up the earth, but rather He will return and make all things right here and wipe away every tear from our eyes and death shall be no more, neither shall there be mourning, no crying, no pain anymore, for the former things will have passed away, as the end of Revelation says. Well, this is how we console one another, by reminding one another that in Christ the new creation really has begun, and one day God will bring it to completion. As the hymn by William Cooper has it, Ye fearful saints, fresh courage take, the clouds ye so much dread, are big with mercy and shall break in blessings on your head. As Paul tells the Thessalonians, one day the clouds will break as Christ the King returns to set all things right. Lastly, Paul tells the Thessalonians to help the weak. From our distance, it's hard to know how the weak are different from the faint-hearted. We don't know if it's because of a, a physical condition, a mental, a spiritual. But in any case, the point seems clear enough. Whoever such persons were then and whoever they might be now, there are those in our midst who need our help. They are not to be despised or worse, perhaps, ignored. It is easier, I think, to be indifferent or apathetic towards others in a big church. Still, smaller churches run the risk of closing in on themselves, neglecting those on the fringes and those who appear from time to time. May it not be so here. May we, as the people of Christ Church, be known as those who welcome others as God has welcomed us and are known for the love we have for one another and for others. As an encouragement, I can say that I think we've been doing a pretty good job of that here. Um, Paul commends churches all the time for the, the good work they're doing, and I think that's appropriate here. That's certainly been the case in my life when I moved to the city last summer, a young guy without any friends or family to intern here, and many of you welcomed me uh, into the body of Christ. You invited me into your homes, took me out to lunch or dinner, and brought me into your, Saturday, your Monday through Saturday lives, all of which I'm grateful for. May we continue to be a community that welcomes others, paying special attention to those on the margins who might need help. Toward all these groups, the disorderly, the faint-hearted, the weak, we are to be patient. The Greek word Paul uses here isn't the usual one for patience. It describes the kind of long-suffering patience that God has shown toward His people from Abraham until now. Paul is telling us how we should behave toward the distressed who sit in the farthest pew and slip out the door without a word to anyone, the susceptible who fall prey to every rumor, the perpetual objection raisers, fault finders, problem pointers. We are to be patient with them, actively seeking their good, as verse 15 says. What Paul encourages exceeds the conventions of making nice to these people. It is active involvement that seeks their good because, again, their good is that of the whole body of Christ. Our lives are bound together. The paradigm of seeking to do good to others, even those who might do evil to us, is, of course, Christ himself. Later, in a letter to the Christians at Philippi, Paul will hold up Christ as the paradigm who emptied himself. By inaugurating God's kingdom in his life, dealing with sin on the cross, and launching the new creation by his resurrection, Christ has brought about a new order of things. He is, he is our paradigm.
as for how we should live. The grammar of the old age, with its attendant beliefs, dispositions, and practices, is passing away. People don't speak that language in the new creation. They speak the language of faith, hope, and love, as well as the fruit of the Spirit. As daytime people, those who have been transferred from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of light, we are to learn this language or grammar with its beliefs, dispositions, and practices, the language of the new creation. The great hope of 1 Thessalonians is not, again, at Christ's return, that we will be whisked away from the earth, but rather that one day Christ will bring his kingdom into its fullness. We will be caught up into the clouds as one coming out from a city to meet a king as he brings heaven to earth and his reign and rule is perfectly done on heaven, on earth as it is in heaven because the two have been brought together. As a church, that is, as Christ's body and the new temple in which the spirit dwells, we foreshadow the consummation of the new creation as we submit in heart, mind, and will to God's good and loving rule, preparing, surprisingly enough, for the day when we will be co-rulers with Christ in the new creation, when the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. As the worshiping, missional, new humanity, the church, we must now, by the Spirit's power, begin to cultivate the virtues proper to this royal priesthood. We must cultivate respect for those over us in the Lord, esteeming them highly in love because of their work. We must tell the truth to one another in love, admonishing one another, encouraging one another, and helping one another, being patient with all. Lastly, we must not repay anyone evil for evil, but rather always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. Such dispositions and practices, such virtues, if you will, befit those whom God has chosen, sent his son Jesus to die for, and knit together in covenant community with one another and with himself. So take a moment now in silence to consider God's word. May we, by his grace and the power of the Holy Spirit, continue to practice these things as we wait upon the coming of the Lord. Amen.